Yes, Fabi, but there is one thing about you that I've learned is that it's not negativity and attacking you. You're going towards negativity to fight it. <laughs> like you're, you try to hunt the negativity. <laughs> oh, if I don't meditate today, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll something bad will happen to me. I agree. That's not. That's I not do a that. Great place. <laughs> that's not a great if place. I, if I don't, that. if I don't say the Ganesha Darvashirsha in the morning, I feel like the hand is gonna, <laughs> the day is gonna end really badly. <laughs> to be honest, guys, I know Fabrizio. I think it is a really wrong thing if you ate audios to ask <laughs> something about Fabrizio's experience. <laughs> that's, that is so true. Like you. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Sahaj Times Podcast. You might have been noticed that since September I've been flying solo without a co-host. A lot of you have been asking where is Fabrizio, is he coming back? Well, today I think we can ask him this question. So Fabrizio, where have you been? Hello everyone. <laughs> I've been everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Uh, but there's one thing that I can say for sure. I miss this very much. So <clears throat> let's go straight into it. Let's go. And you can go back to your duty, which is explaining the topic of this episode. All right. So today we are going to talk about the different shades of negativity. So what is that? And how did we come about this episode? Why did we think about that? So <clears throat> we had a lot of chat with Lele and we both come from Rome, from Italy, uh, which is a country that is extremely happy. And I think that's the reason why Sahaj works really well in Italy, because you go to a new people program, immediately you feel the heart, you feel loved. And just everything feels amazing. Uh, I don't know if you that was your experience coming into Sahaj Lele, was it? This this overwhelming sense of love. Uh, that is the reason why I joined. Like that exactly. is the reason why it became like my full time spiritual work. Exactly. And and you see it in the new people. Sometimes I don't know. To me it's very interesting. They don't even actually that was my case. I didn't feel vibrations for like six months properly, right? I wasn't meditating regularly necessarily. I just wanted to feel that love. I felt like in a family. So I think that's a super strength of Italy. But to me personally, gave me the impression that Sahaj is only joy and everything always good happens and never bad ever happens. And it's interesting because when I leave now and I come back to Italy, I can see that that's definitely the mindset and again <clears throat> it's the beauty of it and it's the essence of Sahaj so it's very important I would say 80% of Sahaj is that is your open heart open Sasrara good Muladhara that's it you don't need much more but there is that 20% that you I feel you need to discover as you move forward because Negativity does exist. Uh, challenges, tests do exist. Yes, I get it. But you said something interesting because you said that negativity does exist, but then you talked about tests and challenges. And to me, tests and challenges are more like for yogis, but not because of negativity, because like maybe the divine is giving you tests and challenges and the negativity is just going against it maybe trying to make it more difficult or maybe it's just another separate thing yeah. you know and i kind of struggle to understand the difference between negativity and the divine test yeah but i mean the way i feel it is that it, it's very much a personal journey right so it it's really up to the person to figure out it's if they've been attacked by negativity or is this a divine test that they have to go through? And sometimes maybe the two things even mix up, right? <clears throat> so you could say there is a certain level of uncertainty in Sahaj, a certain level of confusion, if you want, of what is it that, that why is this happening to me? How many times you ask yourself, right? I feel it's very important that 
a minimum of understanding and you know quote unquote control of our awareness we should always have in life what does that mean uh it means that you know if you do what you're supposed to do in sahaj meaning meditate every day give self realization uh, you know respect your dharma respect your muladhara definitely if you do all these things properly generally 60 70% of your life should go all right you know what i mean there is a there is a cause and effect i mean we tell this even to the new people at the program right i often say look don't foot sock for a week don't foot sock for two weeks and then foot sock every day for a week you want to see the change because that that there is some common sense to sahaj that we should be able to acknowledge and see and enjoy to a certain extent right and then within that there is always that 20% which is hard for us to understand right and it could be karmic reason it could be the, the you're working out something at collective level you're working something at collective level you're working something from past lives that's always a possibility but i don't know listen my life i feel there's always a 70 75% of things that are very clear you did something something else happened you know there's an a cause and effect i just struggle to see the differences and i was talking to a yogini a friend of mine we i was i was sharing this uh, thing that i don't understand the difference and she was like yeah you you can just check the vibrations and i was like that's a real <laughs> fair point to be honest yeah that's good that yeah. never came to my mind is a, like is is this a divine test and then yeah. you check the vibrations but i think but like there is even that a... i don't know if the vibrations are always clear on that like you uh... need to also to be in a state where you you know you are detached enough you are clear enough to fully see it and not always and i can tell you this because i'm a control freak like i really <laughs> like to plan everything to understand anything but i think the greatest challenge in my life as a yogi is to accept that the ultimately will be things for my entire life i will not understand why something happened or why something didn't yes fabri but there is one thing about you that i've learned is okay, that is not negativity and attacking you you're going towards negativity to fight it <laughs> like you're you try to hunt the negativity <laughs> that's something that i I've, i've noticed but that's <laughs> but that's really funny because that's like a fearless maybe dumb way to face it but it's totally <laughs> fearless you know and neg but negativity is there to to be feared because it want to be feared and uh, we, we I'm going towards another point yeah yeah, yeah you know yeah. what i mean yes, but yes is it something that we should fear like we should not fear negativity yeah i fully agree i mean uh i think the the theme that we have been until now the common denominator of everything we said has been moderation right not too much mm -hmm. on one side much on too much on the other so we started the episode saying negativity is real so you should be aware of it right like it exists we we're, we're not yogis that you like i think you know even there is a story very interesting in in the early days in ganapati pule some 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 children drowned in the sea or there were some big issues and shimaji said you know it's not because your yogi is nothing happens to you if you if you if you do things that are not good in your hamsa if you don't look after your children problem will come it's not because you live in a, in some sort of la la land right but i think awareness that has to be there fear shouldn't be there i share another i think very big experience that really uh quite i feel a little bit changed my life uh Uh, and it was a dream with uh, with, with Shimaji in the form of Shidurga and 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 basically in this dream she she, she took me to some sort of uh, of dimensional corridor so it was a corridor that was up in the space you know it wasn't really anywhere it was like in this limbo and he had many doors and she was gigantic and i was like so tiny you know <laughs> next to her and basically she would open a door and show me this room and each one of these room was a dream that i had with her and she say you see here i came to explain you the principle of the mother that i love you very much that no matter what you do i'll be your mother she would close the door 
we go to another door and she say, here, you remember, I gave you a papach because, you know, you misbehaved and so on and so forth. Now, I cannot remember exactly what each dream was about, but the bottom line is that she was saying, you see, every time I come into a dream of a yogi is to teach them something. You should learn something out of this dream. There's a lesson I'm giving you, which is very important that you introspect on what this lesson is. And so we went through this corridor for a few doors. And of course I was like in tears of appreciation and joy of, you know, being able to be there. And then from far away, I hear some noises, some big noises. And I get up and I see like maybe seven, eight demons. They were like bluish purple. They were short, they had weapons. They didn't look too, too menacing, I must say. I mean, they looked menacing, but you know, I felt somehow doable and I was so enraged that they would dare to come where the Adishakti was. I was just like, how dare you even exist in this plane? You know, <laughs> like how, how can you, you know, I basically jumped toward them and it was like, a, it was like a Quentin Tarantino movie or like a John Wick, uh, you know, it, it was so much violence. It's hard to describe. <laughs> Basically, you know, breaking the nose of somebody, breaking the bones, and this, and I felt like, I think there's one of Shika Tikeya's name that is, uh, you know, he's intoxicated with the blood of demons. I almost felt that. I felt like, you know, I, it, it felt amazing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and basically, this goes on and on and on, and, 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 you know, then I come back to Shimaraji, like, blood everywhere. And, uh, and she looks at me, and then I realize, because she stands up, and it wasn't that she was a giant in the dream, is that I was a child. I was like seven, eight years old. I was like a tiny little kid. And then she looks at me with this huge smile. And she's like, you see why you were so rough when you were a kid? You were, you needed to be able to do things like this. This is why you were so rough. And so I, you know, I had a big smile and I was very happy. And then as we was talking, I literally hear the ground shaking like boom, boom. Boom. I'm like, what, what's happening now, you know? And I turn and I see this time a big demon, you know, like, and again, the whole horns, mustache, uh, I don't know, super muscly. He had a club with spikes, you know, like it, it, it looked one of those um, Indian comics, you know, that the demons from mm -hmm. there, from, it really looked a bit like that. And his, his mace, I don't know, must have weighed 500 kilos because it's like he, he, he wasn't lifting it. He was just like, you know, moving it through the ground. I felt like I want to go fight him. But I realized this wasn't my fight. Like, this was a, a goddess fight. It wasn't a human fight. But I didn't want to have fear. So I was like, I was kind of, you know, I'm like, oh, should I go? Should I not? I'm like, he's so big. Should I go? Should I not? And basically, Shimaji does something with her hand and she whisks me away and she puts me next to her as to say, now you rest, this is not for you. And basically, the demon is picking up speed, going towards Shimaraji, and she transforms completely from Sri Lakshmi to Sri Durga in not even a second. It was just like an, an incredible change of personality. And literally, she jumps in the sky, maybe 10 meters up in the sky, and you know, when you watch the Olympic games, the people that dive, that they, they dive mm -hmm. so fast yeah, yeah. that you don't know if they're going backward, forward, right? That you don't understand, you understand they're spinning, but you don't know which way. Basically, she does that as she flies in the sky. Then two huge swords appear in her back. She grabs them and she lands on the demon and she stabs in both hearts, right and left. And the demon is on the floor, done. And, uh, and then basically she opens her mouth and half of the body of the demon is absorbed inside her body. Like it dematerialized and goes inside her. And then all the yogis, out of nowhere, hundreds of yogi pops up and they blow in trumpets and there's this jubilation of, of, of the demon has been killed. And somebody arrived, which I assume was some sort of an angel or maybe a, a maha yogi, I don't know. We, which blew this trumpet of, to announce that the Devi was victorious. And then Shimaji talks to him and asks him to do something. And basically he's, he starts working out on the remaining half body of this demon. And he turns it into a pie. 
like a big giant red <laughs> raspberry pi and i looked at it and i was like oh my god really you know that the, the body of the demons you know become like something that you should eat and basically shimaji says i have done my part of eating half of the body now the rest has to be eaten by the yogis and this is their job to consume the poison to work out the poison of this demon so that it goes away and then basically everybody goes to this uh, angel and what also was very interesting is that some people got a, a, a tiny little bite some people got a full plate some people got a huge plate you know each one of us according to what you could give you've given something and at, fir at first they felt kind of disgusting and very daunting and very challenging but then basically i give a bite into it and he tasted very good like he literally tasted good and it was so easy to do and of course it was so easy that i'm like yeah i'm just gonna give you two bites and finish tomorrow this is not very urgent it's so easy i can do it anytime i put it in my backpack and i noticed that many other yogis do the same instead of just finishing everything on the spot get it done cleanse it they're like ah oh, this actually tastes good let let's leave some for tomorrow and basically, as we all do that, I see another scene where this demon comes back in his uh, kind of ghostly form, if you wish. And he come, calls all his henchmen, the, the little kid people that I killed in the first you know, scene, kind of. And he basically tells them, like, as expected, the yogis didn't do their part of finishing off my body immediately. So I want you to go back, get all the pieces, put them together because this way i can reincarnate again and fight one more time and sorry for the long monologue but I, I would say really two things stand out to me on this the first one is that there are different types of negativity and we need to learn again this is hamsa to know which one you should be fearless and charge into and which one you should just sit down as a little baby and let your mother handle that yes so i might i might also share my experience Experience with that because I have like some sort of similar experience. I went to live uh, in Umbria for like a couple of months alone in the mountains, and in the, I was completely alone. I was meditating like normally, like nothing crazy, nothing too ascetic. And uh, I started having weird dreams. I think I told you, like uh, the knock yeah. on the door. I was dreaming of being chased by like a demon in the corridor of my house. And I will just run straight towards the corner, become really small, and pray, Mother. Okay, you should not be, you should not fear negativity. But when it becomes fearful, yeah, you go, you go there. Like you go if you know Sajja Yoga, absolutely. Even though you're, even though right now you left Sajja Yoga, if something happens, I think people go back to to Mother. And be like, Mother, protect me in this moment. Absolutely. And that is the pulling force that brings you back to Saj, which is also the reason why I'm not really worried about people that leave Saj Yoga. But what I fear, the negativity become way more in disguise, of course. And way more accepted in the in the social on a social level, and things that are like completely obviously. And wrong in Sahaj are easily accepted outside. So if you're like a little bit in the between, you start accepting those things and then you don't understand if you're like under the control of negativity. Uh, not only accepted, but encouraged. encouraged Many yeah. things that we, the Shimaraji clearly said, it shouldn't be this way. And modern society has been encouraged. But to that, I must say, and again, I pull my ears as I said, but my, my father-in-law used to say this thing, which I really love, and I think is genius. He used to say, Satan or the devil or, you know, evil, it's a bad strategist, but it is a genius tactician. What does it mean? It's a bad strategist because if you're in a team against God, you're an idiot, right? Because... You, you, you're, you're fighting the person that created everything and obviously you will never win. It's, it's already, the, the victory is already assigned. So strategy-wise, it's not so smart. Tactically, it's incredible if you see how the negativity subtly, for example, in the West has come. You know, again, I pull my ears, but so geniusly done. 
so I will describe that type of negativity more like a left side negativity, really subtle, that works really like on the left side. And then on the total opposite, like if you're not, if you're, you don't fear the negativity because you're fully protected by God and you will never do anything to disappoint God. But here I think, and I, I've noticed that there is another fear that comes out, which is the fear of punishment by God, you know? And then that doesn't bring you to do the things by heart in a genuine way, but because you fear the, um, the cause effect of not working for God, of not doing the right thing for God. Uh, no, I agree. I mean, to me, to this, there's two points. One is that a healthy fear of God is a very good thing. And one thing I noticed is if you look at the people that were in charge the early early times, mm -hmm. one common denominator of the people that are still here from the 70s and the 80s are those that are they had a decent amount of fear of God, you know, meaning that they knew where the lines were and and you know to 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 always be a bit extra careful around Shimadaji, around Sajja Yoga and so it's a very good thing. Uh, but I agree with you. And it depends also, I think, on the personality of the person. That if that becomes that you do things not spontaneity and you do things out of duty versus out of the openness on your heart. Or another point is that you might have expectations. Meaning, oh, I'm doing problem for Sahaj. I should get a job. That There is no such direct connection. Like the, the divine doesn't own you anything because you meditate or because you're dharmic, you should do it for yourself, right? So again, I think it goes back to awareness. You do something because you acknowledge and you have an intimate relationship with the deities within yourself. If you do it because you want to show off, if you do it because, oh, if I don't meditate today, I'll, I'll, uh, uh, I'll something bad will happen to me. I agree. That's not, that's I not do a that. place. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a great if, place if to I don't at. if I don't say the Ganesha Darvashirsha in the morning I feel like the hand is going the day is going to end really badly like I mean, but because also, it worked once <laughs> I had like a wonderful day and I was like I have to repeat it and if I miss it once it's like over <laughs> but I tell you to, to me the other thing is also context context yes. meaning I felt certain periods of my life where I was like, I needed to be like that. And actually this makes us transition very nicely into maybe the last, at least for my side, the last topic I want to bring up, which is there are certain contexts in which you really need to be hardcore on how you protect yourself from negativity. These contexts don't apply to everyone, don't apply to the average experience, but there are certain contexts in which this is important. Uh, so to give an example is, last week, I think, Lel and I were discussing, should we do this episode? Should we talk about negativity and the different you know, shapes of it? And in particular, to me, what interested me a lot is how negativity attacks the person that work a lot for Sajja Yoga. You remember we had this discussion and literally the day after we talked about this i got a text from a very nice sister that i haven't talked to in the past maybe nine months but basically i don't know where she says hey um i just wanted to ask you this question you know i've been working a lot for Saj and i felt that there's a particular attack on me since i've been doing that I know that you have some experience because if you've doing uh, you've been doing a few things. I've heard some of your, um, you know, maybe at the seminars. I've heard some of your experiences. How can I deal with this? You have some an advice, and to me it was insane because literally the day before we were asking, does it make sense to make an episode on this? Are we gonna look fanatic? Are we gonna, you know, is it a difficult topic to talk about? And then immediately after, you have a person that you didn't talk for nine months as like. Can you talk a bit about this? It'd be interesting, you know? I thought it was quite amazing. And I think I think it's always like, to be honest, guys, I know Fabrizio, I think it's a really wrong thing if you ate audios to ask <laughs> something about Fabrizio's experience. 
<laughs> that that is so true. Like you, <laughs> how many audios did you send there? <laughs> how how long were they? <laughs> yeah. So actually, that's quite funny because we start exchanging. Oh, that's the other thing. I never talk on the phone. Actually, I never speak mm. on the phone real life because I always do this. You know, at lunchtime. So I ended up sending her a 35 minutes yeah. audios, uh, many audios of, of a few minutes each. And so I say that by the end, I'm like, so I don't need to do the podcast. It's it's here, you know, it's done already. I can just forward this to Lely. But anyway, so I, I guess the last topic that we can talk about, which I think is quite interesting, is if you misbehave, you likely, 60-70% chance that bad things are going to happen to you, right? Because... I don't know if I drink alcohol, it's gonna affect my liver. I'm not being attacked by negativity. I'm just doing things that affect my liver. It's, it's super common sense. It's super logical. It's just metaphysics, you would say, right? Then we say there is a thirty percent of unknown things that happen to us, right? Is either your karma, your uh, your cleansing the collective, your cleansing your family, or You've been given a test in so in order to improve. It's unknown, basically. You know, we, we park it as an unknown. And to me, there's a third, at least that I can think of, very big category, which is the very good people that work for Sajja Yoga and they're very dedicated and they put themselves in front of the lines. Uh, they are very much attacked negativity really tries to find these different ways to to affect these people and if you think about it in a logical manner it makes sense right meaning put yourself on go on, cross the other side you know put yourself in the in the mindset of the negativity you have a group of people who you're gonna attack the weakest the one that you know that you can smash and you're gonna attack the strongest because they're the one that you know if they fall it's going to have a domino effect on everyone so i think there is a particular category of of negativity attacks that do happen to people that really uh, i mean not, but deserves it the least you know and i know a lot of people like that i know a lot of people uh that are really wonderful yogis and they somehow have quite tough life i learned through tough experience that you do have to look after yourself extra, that you do have to be a bit more careful if you put yourself in the front line. And it's something very important to keep in the awareness. Yeah, I have the solution. I have the solution <laughs> for this. I love it. Practical <laughs> advice. Go ahead. I have a solution for this. So you mentioned two, per, two type of people get attacked, the weakest and the strongest. The people that are in the between, they are safe. They're like, like in chill. the safe zone. Obviously, uh, like uh, if I were like if I were a thief, I will go into someone's house and try to steal something. I will totally try to steal the most shiny thing. And that is a little bit like how I think the negativity might work. You know, they take the person that is like more in the under the spotlight because yeah. it's shiny. And they attack that person. And I'm not saying that the, the people in the between should stand out. I'm saying that the, the people on the top should lower a little bit. Yeah. No, and everyone should be like on the same level. For example, negativity doesn't know who to pick. And when it's confused, might try to pick someone, but we are all together on the same level. Yeah. So you are not attacking anyone because we are all there together. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> So it's like, we it's going to be like really confusing for them to understand yeah. who to pick, yeah. you know? So when, when there is like someone that is a bit outside, it's good to, to include him also like to protect him a little bit, yeah. but yeah. also the ones that are really on the spotlight to take him down with us and protect him as well. So we yeah. are all protected in, in the same way and it's going to be like really difficult for the negativity to, to attack in general. Yeah. But I think on yeah. this point, which is excellent and I fully agree with it, I think there are a couple of dynamics. The first one is that you, I mean, we are simplifying things here, right? We are oversimplifying. Course, yeah. So it's, it's, it's assumed that we're doing that. But, you know, let's say you have the top level, the super dynamic, they're always in the front. Then, as you say, they have the middle level, they're the moderates. They do sometimes, but only when asked. Uh, and 
and then you have the ones that are half inside half out right you, if you want to make three categories probably you can make 700 categories but you know we're just yeah. making it very simple and i agree to the point that the key is that how the middle joins the top but it's a two-way street meaning on one end the leadership the current leadership has to be open to let others also do and as you say to lower themselves down a bit and uh, i think it's a great idea um i mean even all the projects in which i'm involved i be, be the schools marriages whatever i do see it's very done very collectively you don't have this filler pyramid uh, and it feels good and it's very important but also what's important is that the people in the middle have the desire and the consistency to step up their foot and i can say that because i feel in the youngest age of my life my attention was much more on having fun than on doing on supporting others which also maybe is normal as a younger person but i didn't want to take that responsibility it's not like i wasn't given i didn't want it or maybe i wanted but not every week <laughs> you know what i mean but if you do certain projects if you do certain things your commitment has to be every week you cannot be once every six months so it's a two-way street and the people that are at the very top they have to open the gate to let people more into decision making but also the people there in the middle have to step up to the level of commitment to the level of dynamism so to me that's one point and the other point which i think is really interesting sometimes i've seen it in collectives these uh, overly democratization of things that we have especially in the west they pick somebody who's really kind of disturbed or has a lot of problems and they're trying to put him in the very front to help them that doesn't really help them because if you are half in charge and half outside you are struggling with a lot of very basic things with your attention with your muladhara and putting you in charge of leading the puja is adding a huge load of pressure on yourself you have your own guilt because you know you're not meditating so my point is this step has to be gradual to pick somebody from the very bottom who's struggling with the daily meditation and say okay now you come in the spotlight because we want to promote you yeah you know you mm -hmm. actually hurting them and possibly they collect it to a certain extent yeah and uh it it can happen sometimes and it comes and it goes from zero to 100. Uh, i think sometimes that there is so much pressure on uh, some yuvas some yuva shaktis yeah with the excuse uh, that they are realized soul when people talk about realized souls it seems like they are they are already perfect a complete package complete they are ready to to take over the sahaj uh, world but sometimes like the ego of some yuva shakti are exactly. too pumped uh, they don't even yeah. know why yes but just because yes. they are realized mm -hmm. souls to have that gradual uh movement shift from old generation to the new to the young yeah. generation like an uncle should take under his wing a, a yuva shakti or a group of yuva shakti and teach him the practical things we do in Saja yoga yeah yeah hosting organizing something if that's if that doesn't happen already no no i i think you're completely right and even i can give this example i've lived in different countries i've seen a bit different things and talked to different people about organizing u.s seminars for example mm. and to me i i've noticed there's two ways if you want to do it wrong u.s seminars or two whatever they are there's one way where there's absolutely no inputs from the yuvas and literally the uncles and aunties prepare everything and you just happen to be there but you 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 just didn't do anything for it uh, because they kind of like you're still young you don't understand anything you know just show up and we'll tell you what to do right so that's and i would say maybe that's a bit more prevalent if you want in the east this thing of you know you're young you don't understand just you know you, you wait then you have the polar opposite which is oh you're yuva you know everything because you realize just go by yourself and do everything and these are the kind of seminars where people start matching each other funny business happens because there's absolutely zero supervisions of everything and i remember actually once 
when I was a youth in the US, having a chat with some of the uncles. And I'm like, you should be here with me in the weekends and you should look after me and correct me. I want you to do that because it's just a matter of time before we start messing up because we are kids and we, we are realized we do understand things and so on and so forth. But your presence in my life is very important as you have a mother, a father, an uncle, an auntie. Those are key points. So ideally, the way I feel, for example, a US seminar or maybe the Ganesha Puja also organization, I don't like the idea of having 100% Yuva only things, which means we want to be away from everyone. Completely. And it doesn't have to be somebody who's 70, but let your older brothers and sisters that are, I don't know, 35, 40, 32, be part of it so that they can tell you, look, I've been doing this for 10 years. Let me tell you how I did it. You can still change it if you want. Mm -hmm. We assume they know everything just because they realized, but they don't. And probably that's actually the worst when they're left alone, uh, unhelped, because also they don't get helped. In the moment that they decide, we're going to do this all by ourselves with no consultation, you just don't get help, which is also very frustrating. I think the ideal is to have this supported freedom, you know, if you, if you can call it that. I think that would be the the good place to be at tickle i think we should give i don't know if you have some also i think it'd be a good idea out of our experience some sort of practical advice of how do you look after yourself especially when you feel in the attention on negativity uh, i think that's a good uh, it's, it's a good thing to share and go for it yeah. If people have have uh, even stories they can write to us or put in the chat, I think it would be useful. Well, one one very important one, and I think there's a story connected to Lely on this one, is since I got married, uh, my wife is much better than me at, at, at looking after me and herself. And she used to do this thing very interesting. Uh, whenever I spoke in public, like tonight, or even at such event, even with 20 people, not a million people, just, you know, a group of 30 people, if I did any sorts of public attention speaking, she would always do the bad eye treatment when we come back home. And uh, to this day, actually, I don't know how it's done because she always does it to me. <laughs> uh, it works amazingly. And, and at first, I used to kind of fight her back on this. I'm like, look, I just spoke in front of 20 people. These are people that love me. You know, <laughs> they don't hate me. And <laughs> I don't need this. <laughs> it's, uh, don't... At best, uh, they are neutral, you know, <laughs> at, best, at worst. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm like, I got good attention from them, you know. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I got good attention. And she said something super uh, wise, uh, which is very typical of her. And she said, look, it's not that they're going to have on purpose negative attention on you, but you have entered the attention so again it's not them that necessarily are jealous or whatever but is the being in so many attention at the same time which will make you as you were saying before lele visible to negativity like you're this shiny object in a house so to me it was very important to understand that logically you don't do all this cleansing and this that because there is one guy either in the collective or outside a single specific guy that hates you and and is doing a bad eye on you there might be actually also that, but 90% of the cases is not. You do this, it's a very subtle essence of, of looking after yourself. And I know that you have some experiences with the podcast in the past few months. Yeah, but that's actually the reason why we stopped uh, doing the podcast for a while. Eh? <laughs> it was a bit too much. Uh, I think maybe the podcast, uh, uh, since it has like good reviews, it had good reviews so far. There is a sort of amount of attention, and uh, it fired back at us. I think definitely a little bit on me, and uh, but we both had to stop doing the. No, I was gonna say, you publicly agree that you're going to the bad eye treatment next week and learn how to do it. Right? That was the. That was the yeah. That that's, was the deal. that's a thing about me. That's a thing about me. <laughs> I know that maybe some attention might. And <laughs> Fabrizio sent me a five minutes audio with a bad eye treatment <laughs> in 
February 2023. <laughs> Still nowadays, one year later, I've never even tried it. Never even came to my mind, even though I fainted. <laughs> like one day after recording a program, uh, an episode, I fainted. Like straight yeah. away, I, I was like completely violet on my face. And I was like, you know what? I'm not doing the bad eye treatment. <laughs> I'm not the lazy. stubbornness till the end. The stubbornness just because you sent it to me. Just <laughs> if someone else did, I would have done it easily. <laughs> Look at this egoistic uncle. <laughs> Sending, sending me treatment a bad eye treatment oh, that's it there that he himself doesn't know he his <laughs> wife doesn't <laughs> no, but you know the reason the reason why i brought it up is quite funny but uh, i was telling this to my wife i whenever i speak to you it reminds me a lot of me when i was 25 26 mm -hmm. and i think it's almost no it's also normal that at each age you you have a different thing but there is something that i feel i have learned very clearly in the past four or five years which I wish I knew before it happened. And I have a very cool, I have a very cool example that uh, in maybe just 10 minutes I'd like to share. But it is, it's, again, it's, it's something quite, uh, it quite, I feel, changed a bit my life and it was important to, it was important to share. Is um, there were two guys just uh, attacking my wife and they, you know, in a non innocent way and I just lost it completely you know i just i just felt rat you know the the it wasn't anger it was something more it was something else and it was a bit like uh you know these movies uh the, the the avengers movies where they smash the head of the guy so hard that he makes a a, a hole in the ground so basically i was doing that i just today you're brutal huh? yeah, yeah, you're today. using a certain <laughs> it's an episode about violence <laughs> <Today>. <laughs> But no surprise because we're talking about negativity. So yeah, basically, man. I was doing that, and it, fe and it felt amazing. It just, just, I felt so good to let out, but it was anger, basically, right? And then I was very surprised because this guy, whose head I'm smashing into the floor and is literally disintegrating, looks at me with the biggest smile on earth, and I'm like, "What are you laughing at?" You know. <laughs> And uh, basically, with his biggest mind, most calm possible, it's like, well, this is our plan all along. We are generating all sorts of emotions in you because if you feel guilt, if you feel sad, if you have fear, if you're angry, you will not be in Sasrara and we win. So, and if you're not in Sasrara, it doesn't matter that you do such projects, it doesn't matter because whatever you do, won't be auspicious, won't be successful. So our goal is to keep you emotionally engaged, emotionally reactive toward negativity. It can be fear, guilt, anger, whatever it is. As long as we can make you feel that, we win. And I took a step back and I'm like, damn it, you know, I fell right into the trap. And and basically I'm like, well, jokes is on you, dude. We have a haven tomorrow. <laughs> I was like, you came on the wrong day in my dreams, you know? I'm like, now I know your face. I know where you live. I, I turned into like a Scarface, you know? <laughs> I was like, I know who your friends are. I'm like, you are going to go into the oven, you know, immediately. So then I wake up and, you know, the next day in the night, I go to the oven, which I was supposed to lead, you know? Now talk about being in the front line and getting the attention. And uh, basically, I was normal, I had no problems, I sit for the haven, 5-10 minutes before it, I start coughing, like a little, um, almost like allergy cough, you know, but like continuous, that I didn't have before. And incrementally, it increases to the point that I went to one of the brothers here leaving, I was like, Hanuman, I, I can't leave the haven, I think you have to leave because I can't speak properly, um, I keep coughing and this is not alright. So he led it, absolutely beautiful haven, amazing vibrations. I go home and the cough just get worse and worse and worse. And basically that night I ended up in the hospital because I couldn't breathe. And uh, the, the doctor at the hospital is doing all sorts of checks on me. And basically it's like, well, like you have all the symptoms of somebody who has very heavy asthma. 
but I checked and you don't have asthma. So it's like, I don't know what you have. I cannot explain. And he probably was weirded out and was like, I know what I have. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm like, just give me some medicine. I know what it is. And then it turned into the demon of your dream. <laughs> no, thankfully not. Thankfully and it was not. like, I got you. <laughs> I got you. You're not awake yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, but basically it was insane because they got, and then they gave me medicine. I don't have asthma. I've never had asthma in my life. That night at 4 a.m. I had to go to the hospital because I couldn't breathe. And uh, basically um, then with the medicine, I was fine in the next day. But to me, out of this whole big long story, there were two very important things. One is that, again, know which battles to fight and when to step a little bit back. And I felt I was very confident about the fight we ever have. And I was like, you can't touch me. You know, we ever have not You know, I'm going to destroy you. Uh, but no, I went to the hospital. So the point is, be humble in your confidence, which is very difficult to do. Definitely, I haven't mastered that. And I think it's very much a challenge. But the other is, again, um, this is a big gear toward the people that have heavily worked for Sahaj. Um, I'm not somebody that does a, they would do a lot of treatment usually. I wouldn't. I, I would say my strength is more like the enjoying the meditation versus the strong discipline on meditating every day, you know, about a long time, for example. But in the past years, I think I've improved my discipline a lot out of necessity. And that's very, very important. Again, I, I link it back to, I think, especially you us, those that are in the go, that do a lot of things, live in a national, like, you really have to take the extra time to look after yourself because these these attacks are not random you know and the story i'm telling you are a joke compared to if you talk to people that came to Saj in the 80s and the 90s and spent time with shimaraji like what what i told you is like a, a fairy tale compared to what actually they went through and who they faced and so on and so forth so it's real it happens for real and it's, let me say it if we spread it, we, you know, it's less on everybody else, you know, it's more doable, it's more manageable, but that doesn't take away that it's really up to you to discipline yourself and to look after yourself in that way that you protect yourself and your family also. Uh, so last, maybe last point is if negativity doesn't get to you, it definitely will get to the ones that you love the most. It could be your kids, your wife, your, you know, brother, sister, whatever. And so to have that also as a collective, as a, as a collective nucleus, to look after each other in that sense. Yeah, I was about to ask you about that. So family as a family group, but also as a collective. And that is obvious. You, you only need one person that is not uh, balanced to ruin years of yeah. work. Huh? That's true. So... That's a very good yeah. point. Not only that, but also what I've noticed, I don't know if you felt it, but I've seen in many Sahaj families where the members of the families are yogis, right? Mm -hmm. um, because within a family, you also have some sort of fixed relationship sometimes. For example, the older brother is always telling the younger what to do or or the, 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 the younger one is always kind of the problem maker or, or, or the mama is a bit left side, whatever. There's different dynamics in each family. The negativity actually tries on the highway of the fixed dynamics you have uh, and really pushes hard on those unresolved conflicts that you have within your family. And to me, that is also why I think Shimaji created both the Sahaj school systems and the ashram and collective living system because while family is a great thing and you have to look after each other and you get the love and all of that, it can also become um, stagnant in your relationship. And so if you're taken out and you go live in an ashram, all of a sudden you have different brothers and sisters and people that do things completely different from you. So that, that cemented negativity, that cemented bad relationship also is not there anymore because it's refreshed um 
and I see even again, I mean, wherever I can, I try to speak nicely about such schools because I, at least my kids are having such an amazing experience. But you see, I see with my kids, like, just two of them, right? The older brother, they're both boys, tend to tell the younger what to do, which is extremely normal in a brother's relationship, especially at the age. But when the younger goes to such school, he has other younger brothers, and he can express the quality of the right hearts toward them. So he escapes. You see what I mean? The bilateral relationship of continuously being told what to do. Uh, so I see huge benefits, and I think Shimaji did that on purpose to create this collective, the schools, but also collective living, not to allow the negativity to cement itself in those relationships within the family. Yeah, uh, I know your younger, <laughs> your younger child, <laughs> child and uh, he, he is the person that goes to the principal to tell him what to do. So <laughs> this is another story. Yes. But As we uh, said, every family has its own dynamics. <laughs> no, because also when you like when you're working on another person and you feel like a catch on the person is yeah. a, the boot and then you feel that catch moving on the other fingers i think yeah. it happens the same with the other members of the family yeah so the boot now is on is on me that's going to be on my brother it's going to be on my exactly. sister and different days and i don't know like yeah. but also you have also another interesting routine huh? no uh, yeah uh, which is the paper burning on thursday yes <laughs> which is my pizza day Thursday night. <laughs> But for you, is the paper burning. I have to improve my <laughs> Sahaja routine. Your routine. <laughs> you know, I actually have people that wait to tell me if they have a problem on Thursday. Because then they know that it goes on my paper burn pile. <laughs> it's, it's a thing. I'm not kidding. It just actually yeah, it's a, <laughs> I tried it twice. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm still yeah, struggling with that. <laughs> I think this is good. It goes, um, it goes under the practical advice, and I think it's a, it's a worth one giving. Um, it doesn't have to be paper burning. It can be, it should be to give yourself abundance. But actually, and this is something at least for me, it's been working wonders. And, and by this, I think we can close, uh, we can end this episode. So yes. thank you everyone for listening. Thank you everyone for joining. If you want to share any experience, any story, you can send us an email, you can comment below. It's also your Sahaj routine, if you want to help uh, anyone to give advices. Um, we are doing the episode, but the comments are there, so you can share anything you want. So feel This free is to something, actually, I would be super interested mm -hmm. if people can share with us how they when whenever they feel attacked or whenever there's an issues how they deal with it what helps them i think that i personally not even for the public but i would really love to know about that so and mm -hmm. if you don't feel uh, comfortable to put in the comment that is public just send it to we have uh they can send it to us in, in the emails email, no? we have everything yeah, yeah. By emails yeah that that would be very cool if we could do that it'd be very cool and so thank you everyone for listening Of course, as you as you've listened, uh, Fabrizio is back, <laughs> and uh, so I'm really happy to have you back, Fabrizio. Thank you for your stories. I'm back to stay because this is so much fun, and uh, you know, I don't know if it transpires, but what I really like of this is that, um, you know, of course we prepare a bit and we take it seriously, but. What's really fun is that with Lele, we really take it easy and, you know, we laugh a lot, we enjoy a lot. And even when we have guests, they come and they crack up jokes. And I think that's that's how you want it in science, right? You want to do something a bit seriously, a bit well. Uh, but I think the fun part of this podcast is that it's really kind of free and enjoyable and, you know, relaxed. So it, it's been super. It's been really super to be back. So, so happy. Yeah, and sadly, the funniest parts of the of the episodes are the part that we have to cut. That we cut, absolutely. That we cut. <laughs> but, 
So and thank there, you. there's a lot of those. <laughs> yeah, I mean, thank you everyone for listening. <laughs> this was the Sahaj Times podcast, The Many Shades of Negativity. Bye. Goodbye, everyone.